I have a question for you. How do you define who you are? If you have introduced yourself to someone you didn't know, you're out, it was your first day at work, or you were sitting at a bar, and someone asked you, introduce yourself, how would you define who you are? Take a moment to think about that. How would you define who you are? So we're live, it's a beautiful evening, for a pen and paper, and enjoy a powerful seminar we've got planned for this evening. So if you've got a pen and paper already, please grab a pen and paper. Grab one now. You're going to need a pen and paper. We've got a lot to cover in a very short space of time. We are live. I'm doing, in the best part of an hour, what I normally do in about 450 hours. So I'm going to condense a lot of information, short space of time, grab a piece of paper and a pen, and interact. Let's play ball. We're going to get back to why we ask this question throughout the seminar. So hold that thought. Hold that thought. How would you define who you are? Take a moment. Write down a sentence. I'm going to ask you a question. The question I've got for you is, why is mental health going through the roof? Why is mental health... And so this has come from me. You can do your own research. Why is mental health going through the roof? I've been working as a therapist for many, many years, and a coach, and I've seen therapy and mental health and mental health issues around the world. I travel the world doing seminars and one-to-one -one work. It has gone through the roof. And ask the question, why? Think about it. Why? And so it's me saying it. Do your own research. According to many articles, mainstream articles, they're saying that in the next 20 or so years, it's going to affect people more than any other health condition. So they say. So in all this stuff in the last 10, 15 years about obesity and all the like, and don't get me wrong, there's an issue of obesity and weight and everything else, but think about it. What causes the obesity in the first place anyway? Surely our state of mind is going to contribute towards how we feel about ourselves. And obesity is connected to, for the most part, what we eat, consume, emotional eating, stressful eating, and everything else that goes with eating the wrong foods with low nutritional value. Now why? It's just not kind of me. Do your own research. The last five, ten years I've been doing so much research. Why? Some people say it's awareness in the past. People weren't and wouldn't talk about it. Some people say it's the social media and the way we use it. Some people say it's isolation, modern day living. My suspicion is it's a combination of all those things. Yet, what I say is let's do something about it. Let's do something about it rather than get hung up on the issue. Let's find a solution. Now, I, I tell you, do your own research. And I'm not saying every article is going to be valid or 100% valid. It is saying that, do your own research. And I think about for one moment, how well do you know, or maybe it's happened to yourself, you've gone through a period where you felt low and not functional, not functional. You've been under par. You haven't felt great. Many people out there experience that for prolonged periods of time. Now, you could be the strongest mentally, physically person in the world. We all go through challenges in life. We all go through times in life where the kryptonite, just in uh, Superman, we all go through periods in life where we need a bit of a boost. Everyone goes through that. Have you ever underperformed yourself? Have you ever felt that? You've struggled, your clients struggle to get out of that rut they're in. We all go through that. Now, what are your expectations in life? I ask you that question. What are your expectations in life? What do you expect out of life? What do you want? What do you expect out of life? Our expectations, and it's great to expect things and, and, and eyes of success in the world. It is saying that life from how you're born is going to bring you plenty of challenges along the way. Life will bring you challenges, and sometimes we forget about what we have and we focus on what we want, rather than appreciate what we've got already, that once what you've got now at one point will have been something that you wanted. So I say to you expectations, because many people have got their own expectations, and it's great to set goals, and I advocate setting goals, and as long as the goals are meaningful to you, and as long as you can appreciate there's certain times that we're going to feel great and we're going to feel down, that's part of the bargain. We're human beings, we're creatures of emotion. 
We've gone through a period where we've seen so much literature about how to feel happy, how to feel great, how to feel this, that, and the other. Rather than embrace emotion, sometimes it's through your biggest adversity and there's emotional periods where you feel despair. You, you grow as an individual. You grow. And I know from my own experiences, and I've been through many things myself, it's through adversity and the pain of adversity. So I say you've got to feel a bit of pain, but find joy. Find things that you really enjoy as well, because life's going to give you hits on the way. I dream of the day. I dream of the day that the education system has a system where we teach young people emotional intelligence, values like empathy, compassion. We teach people how to believe in themselves, meditation, mindfulness. We teach young people the benefits of exercise, not just PE, but the benefits of activity. We teach people to disconnect themselves from the world we live in and have that peace of mind to go away from social media. Social media is great to a point, yet in saying that, what's meant to make your life easy is making it hard. You see people all the time on phones. And I, I do remember the day we, we bring this in schools. I remember the day you go to a GP and the GP says, you know what, as well as, I'm not for or against medicine, by the way. If you come to my seminars, you'll hear me talk about med I, I'm not medically qualified. Medicine's not my field. But I do have an opinion on medicine. And my opinion is that, yeah, I'm sure some people need it for, for how they feel. But what I'm also saying is that you can't just rely on that alone. You've got to do other stuff as well. And we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about other things you can do. The brain can produce chemicals. People have a bit of pain in their life. When they cry to the doctor, I'm not saying everybody, and I'm not saying trivializing what people go through, but they're looking for that quick fix. If it's not alcohol, it's antidepressant. And, you read the stats, antidepressants are going through the roof. And whilst I'm not for or against, I'm sure some people need it. Also, be proactive. Except sometimes you're going to feel down, but don't stay there. And I, don't, I know it's a spectrum. People have a spectrum of how they feel and think. And some people go through very challenging times in life. And I know that. I appreciate that. I've been through times myself. Yet you're saying that it's about being as functional as you possibly can. And embracing life. Because life is a gift. This is it, guys. This is it. It's no rehearsal. If people knew how long they had to live when they were born, would they live their life the same way? It is no rehearsal. This is it. You've got a gift. And people consume themselves in reading these papers and um, spending hours on social media and watching meaningless TV. This is it. This is it. There's no rehearsal. There, never, there never was another you. There is no other you in how many billion people on the planet. There will be another you in this genetic form. And this genetic form. So make the most of your life every day. Treasure it like a gift. Treasure it. Life is beautiful. And I dream of the day that a GP says to people, you know what? Meditate. Walk. Do things that you really enjoy doing. As well as whatever they're qualified to do, to give as well. Integrate an approach. And in the training course I run, I'm getting more and more medical people coming on board. And they're realizing that we need to have a collective approach. We need to. But if you wait for that to happen, it could wait a million years. You've got to be proactive and, and do things for yourself. And step off the treadmill. We're on this treadmill of life, running and running and running and running and running on a treadmill of life. You get up, you go to work, you come home, you drop the kids off to whatever, they go on their social media, you go to... All these things are happening. Oh, when I block a hamster, 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 hamster. Come off the treadmill and, and look at your life. Are you where you want to be? Is this it? Are you where you want to be in life? Is the question. Are you watching soaps on TV? Are you watching The Only uh, Way is Essex on TV? Are you reading the Daily Mail? Are you listening to rubbish on the radio? Or are you taking stock of your life? Look, I'm all for watching stuff on TV. I like a good film, a sporting event. But it's a time to roll your sleeves up as well. There's a time to, you know what? Roll your sleeves up and decide, is this it? And not get caught up in all the things that people do, whatever they do, roll the sleeves up, decide, you know what, I'm going to run what I'm a race. I'm going to decide what I want and go for it. And, and this is what this is about, coming off that treadmill and reassessing our life as well. And sometimes rebooting the brain. Throughout your life, you've been exposed to TV, you've been exposed to now social media, newspapers, radio, an education system that's outdated. An education system... I'm a, I'm a qualified teacher myself, I've done my teacher training, I've taught, I've lectured, and I'm all for teachers, you do a fantastic job, you're wonderful people, but this education system is outdated. It's got to go. 
It's toast. Get rid. It's time to bring in a more dynamic education system where people can pursue their passions, their goals. To heck with all this sitting in a classroom and all day long, all the time, and, and not getting to, to express yourself. And if you don't conform to the way they want to conform in education, they call you labels. They call you AD, ADHD is called now. All these labels that are coming out all the time. And I'm not saying that people don't have these conditions. I'm sure they certainly do. What I'm saying is that let's not label people. Let them express themselves. Find how they learn. Some of the most intelligent minds in the world ever and now were labeled having one thing or the other. And they've succeeded. We try to, to lost the education system. That's my rant. It needs, to update, it needs to be updated. So if you're listening to someone, you're listening to anyone, I've been any influence on that, you guys come to my seminar sometimes, let's revamp it. We are making headway, but let's take it to a whole new level. Because that's the only way we're going to make a big impact in this spiraling, spiraling, spiraling mental health. And I'm not saying anyone's going to go away and do anything um, you know, silly with their life, but they're going to, well, if what you want to call silly, in their mind I'm sure they don't see it that way, but people do bad things to themselves, but they might not live a life that they deserve. So it's really important we give people all the confidence and tools to thrive. So it's about rebooting your mind. Cognitive reprogramming is about rebooting your mind, and getting rid of all those mental viruses like a computer that pollute your head. They pollute your head and you just got to get them out. Get out! I want to think clearly. Okay? What do you want out of life? What do you want is the million dollar question. And wake up and live, I say. Get rid of the viruses and live and you're alive. Jump for joy. People's expectations, they, they, they focus on money and cars and, and, and materialism. And I'm not, look, I'm, for, I'm not against that, by the way. I'm not against that. But what I will say as well is that there's more to life than that. You can only live in one house. You can only drive one car, eat so many meals. You get hung up on, you see it everywhere. Earn this, earn that, earn whatever. I'm all for people making money and doing well. You can't live without money in this world that we live in, but also follow your passion. Follow your passion and wake up and live if it's possible. What makes you happy? These are questions that we don't ask ourselves very often. We get so focused on the day to day living. Focus, what makes me happy? You know, the happiest people I've met don't have the best of things. I've worked with many clients over many years, people who've suffered the most horrendous set of circumstances, they aren't any fortunate than anybody else. They've had challenging upbringings, bad things happen to them, but it's what they focus on. Now some people are never happy no matter what they've got. They got money, they can have relationships, they can never get a wish for in the eyes of the world, but they're still miserable. Look at these people that go on to be famous stars and really wealthy, and if the answer was just wealth and fame, then why do these people get really, really famous and wealthy, and you see them sometimes kill themselves, and you see them sometimes you know, get drunk or depressed and all that everything else really. I'm not against having a goal. I'm also having a goal. I love goals. I work with some higher level athletes myself. I work with some top business people. Great having a goal. But I'm also for focusing on appreciating life. Every breath that goes into those lungs is a gift, by the way. It's a gift. And you only appreciate things when sometimes they get taken away. It's a gift. So mental skills training is what I'm all about. Just like you would go to the gym to get in shape physically, you eat nutritious meals to get in shape as well. Mental skills, it's an ongoing thing. You don't eat one meal and then you, you know, you're super slim. You don't go to the gym once and you can run a marathon uh, comfortably or you, you feel super fit. You've got to keep working at it. You've got to keep working at it and every day. I don't know where you are in your life right now. I don't know you, but one thing I will say, every day is a fresh start. Whatever's gone on before, you can go forward. I know some people are suffering adversity. I know you've got challenges out there. People have got health problems, financial issues, and sometimes you feel you're so deep in a hole. Listen, I've been there myself. I've had challenges. Twice I've been without a home to live. Twice as a teenager I suffered horrendously. We didn't have no money. We were as poor as you could be. In, in, in modern Australia without these homes. I come from a poor migrant family. My dad gets injured at 14 years of age. Mum was really ill, no one working, no money. There were days we'd go out food, and all times we'd go to school and experience so much in, in such a short space of time. And they go to work, and I was working in the factory very young to make some money to eat. And on top of that, we had many other challenges and, and bullying and, and many things that would go on at that point. Many, many things I don't even care to mention, but I always felt the next day, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow is going to bring something different, and you've got to make it happen. And I found something to make it happen for me. I went to sport and turned to sport, and I turned to learning some of the stuff I do these days. I turned to NLP and hypnotherapy, very young in life, and I just found the outlet. 
and got caught up in the wrong crowds and did all the wrong things. And I've got to get out of that. I've got to go forward and make something of my life. And tomorrow's a new day. Whatever you're going through, I had health issues. I had very severe asthma as well. Very severe asthma I had as a young person. So, you know, I've had stuff along the way. And you've got to believe that tomorrow, no matter what you're going through, because we don't really know what the world, world needs. We don't know. You know, exercise is great. And I'm not saying exercise, going to the gym and, and running on boring treadmills, if that's not your thing. It's not my thing. I'm saying exercise, you know, get to the park and kick a ball about. You know, kick a ball about the park. You know, go, go tamping bowling. Tamping bowling is a hard thing. You know, having fun. Get out there. Family sports. And play some sports with your family. Whatever. And it's not just that boring. But the chemicals you produce, the endorphins you produce when you exercise, if you could put them in a pill, for goodness me, how powerful would it be? And you don't need a pill to flood your mind with endorphins or walk around the beautiful countryside, um, beautiful summer evenings. It doesn't go dark till late. It's light at half ten sometimes or ten o'clock. You walk and, and enjoy yourself. Find the beach, walk even, stroll, walk with your partner, hold hands, have fun. For goodness me, get out there and exercise at least once every other day to flood the mind with endorphins. And when, have you ever done a session? of exercise and you felt great afterwards. Have you ever done a session and you feel fantastic? It's priceless, isn't it? No chemical, no substance is going to give you that feeling. Instead of wondering when your next vacation is, like some people do, I can't wait for my next vacation, I'm going away to tropical paradise, tropical paradise, I'm going away to, you've seen them before, tropical paradise, I see it sometimes on social media, I can't wait four months to go to tropical paradise, and, and they wish your life away. What about building a life in the here and now? And you might be saying, Jim, it's easy for you to so say, you like what you do, Jim. Listen, to get to where I am, I work hard. And I work hard to stay, and I get, I'm here because I want to help people. I worked in professional football for many years, and I was better paid than what I am now, and I could have gone on to be, and been anything in that industry, because I did really, really well. I won stuff in the game, but it wasn't for me. And I took a big pay cut into the unknown, to do what I do these days. And in the very beginning, I was boring broke. Broke, because I walked away from it all. And it was tough, and I walked away from professional sport to work and do teaching and, and helping young people in care homes and, and secure you and that sort of stuff, and then started building a business, helping young people in schools, and then got myself helping business people and, and help sports people. I used to help before, now I have a approach where I help all, everyone, from, from therapy right through to coaching to business people, and I love what I do, because that's my passion. I never thought for once, you know, the money or whatever, Always stay humble, uh, humble. And you might think, of, well, Jim, you had time. I didn't have time, I've got family too. I'd be up till the old hours studying and learning and, 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 and I still do these days now. I'm never too old to learn, you always learn. I never know it all. And that's the key. And, they, and the people who plan for their vacation, they wait for it. They wait for tropical paradise. Four months of the Then they get to tropical paradise. They land in beautiful paradise. And within a day, they get bitten by all these mosquitoes. And then they're itching everywhere. All these mosquitoes everywhere here. It's too hot. It's too this. It's too that. And then they're back to square one again. I can't wait to go home for normality. Then they come back home again. And then in work and on the office desk. And it's like, oh, I wish I was back on holiday. The answer is within. The answer is within. No matter what you do, I have days when I do what I do, and it's tough sometimes. It's very challenging. Be a therapist for a day. It is tough. And if you don't love it, you're not passionate about helping people, you won't get very really far. You do because you love it. Yet the rewards of helping someone overcome an issue, whatever it might be, are phenomenal. So building a life. Building a life. And it might take doing night school. It might take doing a course, educating yourself. It might just be you're young and starting out. Build a life you enjoy. You change your thoughts and you change your mood. Your thoughts, and we're going to talk about your thoughts throughout the course. It only takes one person to change your life, and you, only you can do it. Only you can change, and that's the philosophy of company reprogramming. You can change. No one's going to do it for you. If you're looking for salvation, stop looking for salvation. No one's going to come and save you. You've got to save yourself. And I've been in a situation myself when I was broke, living on the street, nothing. And what saved me was myself, determination. Determination, had nobody, nobody. So I say to you, look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, it's me. Tell yourself now, I'm gonna change. I'm not waiting for somebody who could change me for me. And you gotta believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, then nobody else will. So believing in yourself is key. And you don't feel like you're out of order in your brain. Because I've had times in my life where I felt that way. Again, you know, scrambled head. We all go through that. And the key is, is to 
get yourself out of that situation and refocus again. Because everything comes to an end at some point. And you've got to sometimes build back up again and reinvent yourself. So cognitive reprogramming, what I developed over many, many years, many, many, many years, I've put together stuff from NLP, neurolinguistic programming, stuff from CBT, mindfulness, exercise, philosophy, the whole thing is in a toolbox. And it's ironic really the CBT is really structured. If you're a CBT person, you'll know there's a lot of structure in there. And hypnotherapy, hypnotherapists will know, is very messy. Traditional or you know, real hypnotherapist, it's, it can be very messy in the sense that you go to a session and really you suggest the bit that you use suggestion, you use interventions, you don't really know how it's gonna go, so you need a very very clear outcome. And and rolling them all into one, some sort of magic. And the reason why I did that, because I felt, well, you know what? People say to me, Jim, what's better than therapy, CBT, this, what, what's your opinion? Listen, whatever works for the individual is key. But I know in my experience that you've got to be flexible. You've got to be flexible. And sometimes people say to me, Jim, you talk about your intuition, your gut instincts. What's all that about, Jim? It's about trusting in your unconscious mind, by the way. And I'll tell you how powerful the unconscious mind is, to give you an example. Years ago, um, and I've had people come to me who struggle with mainstream therapy and they've come along to me and I've helped them years ago and this girl I was working with, fibromyalgia, she had for four years, she was ill, bedridden, severe anxiety, she was seeing a CBT person so she told me anyway um, and, and she was because I found a CBT person up to verify I could work with her and CBT person I think was through the NHS and she was seeing, it, seeing uh, her sorry, uh, for a number of years and she was struggling for a number of sessions sorry, to try and get better so she came to me and said, you an approach and she went from being bedridden to getting her life back in a very short space of time, doing martial arts and, and, and doing university and driving again. And people said, Jim, how do you do that? Even the consultant she was seeing at the time, who was managing the condition, had wrote or got his secondary right letter and said, Jim, how do you manage to break that anxiety, that cycle? I don't manage, I didn't do anything, me. I did nothing. It's not an ego trip, it's just technique. But I can only think the difference between me and on several occasions, it's similar to that situation, not identical, various situations, what I've done is, is decided to use my intuition, which technique to draw on when, not be a clone. So if you're a therapist, don't be a clone, step one, step two, step three. And I know those of you who work in the NHS and stuff like that, you've got constraints and various stuff, but I say to you sometimes think beyond the box. And that's the key. And the key message I say here, not to blab on about me, what a great therapist I am, because I'm just... An ordinary bloke who, who studies and learns and has his intention and heart to help people. So I am. But I thought if I can draw techniques. And that's what made me think. Cognitive reprogramming. Can we pull everything together and carry on and keep learning? Because people do a course many years ago and they carry on working from that framework. You've got to keep learning, keep inventing yourself, keep learning new techniques and, and deciding what to use. So in the case of the girl I was working for after four years for anxiety, we use a number of interventions to help her improve her health and get better and move forward, which is key. But the first thing was to break the anxiety, which she had, which was debilitating. Okay, now very briefly, the conscious unconscious mind, and we don't have a lot of time to go into things in a lot of detail. If you're not sure what NLP is or CBT and the therapy is, you can email me, I'll send you some literature, some theory. I don't have time to get bogged down on theory because we've got a lot to cover short space of time. But think of the iceberg. You're going to see 10% of the iceberg, the rest is unconscious. This is the part of your brain. We'll call it, for the benefit of the seminar, because I know some of you are going to say, call it one thing or the other. It's called unconscious mind. What controls your breathing? What controls your breathing? What controls your heart rate? Your heart beats 100,000 times a day. What controls it? What controls your hair? Your hair grows, your fingernails grow. All these things. If you have a wound, it heals itself. And habits and emotion are in here as well. This is a massive memory bank. From the very day you're born, every mess, your mind is in there it's on some level. Okay? It's all in the unconscious mind on some level. So it makes sense to me to dig deep. And I know some therapists who say, they know unconscious mind. Well, what is a label? Whatever you want to class it as, it is what it is. But there is a part of the mind that is on autopilot. The part of the mind, you know when you first learn to drive? Conscious, first key, second key, stall. Now you can drive to a destination you've been many times without thinking about getting there. And you can even have a philosophical conversation with someone while you're driving. Or, or talk on the phone. Don't talk on the phone when you drive, by the way, but some people do. 
and you get there. And if you've got to drive somewhere new, you've got to constantly process that first. And it can be still a little bit tricky sometimes, but you can still get there. So that's different parts of the mind. So emotions happen here. And if people say, well, emotions, think about it. Logical part of the brain. People know smoking's bad for them, but they carry on doing it because it fulfills an emotional need. The behavior is driven by emotion, isn't it? So it makes sense to go in here, be, to sort things out. And logically talk to people. You know it's bad for you. You know smoking's bad for you. You know that relationship's bad for you. You know this is bad for you. This, there's enough stuff on TV telling you that. But this part of the mind is, 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 is relatively more primal. And we go into more detail. The limbic system's in here. The emotional system of the brain is unconscious. You don't control it. Logic. If that breaks away, that will always win. So we need to get in deep. Okay. And we use hypnotherapy. I don't even any this about hypnotherapy. Have you been hypnotized before? And I bet you're saying, well, I've not been hypnotized before. You can't hypnotize me. Well, I get some of that. Well, hypnotize is not just about the watch. It's just an altered state of awareness or a heightened state of awareness. I've heard many labels differently. Well, it's a relaxed state of mind that we're more susceptible. Let's keep it at that. For argument's sake. It's a state of mind where we go to a frequency where you're more susceptible. And it's sort of the state of mind you are when you're drifting to sleep or when you're getting up in the morning and your mind is chattering on. That's the sort of state. Or it could be a different state where you're watching TV and two hours goes like a minute or reading a book. Or time distortion, you could be waiting for a bus and it's raining and a minute feels like 10 minutes. Or you could be waiting for a bus and you're talking to a nice looking girl or guy and, and 10 minutes feels like one. So really, we're going to trance all the time. And the key thing is for me in cognitive reprogramming is that we're in, we, we, we've brought into these trance states, these beliefs throughout our life. And to give an example, years ago I was working with this young girl and she had an eating disorder. And I said to me, Jim, she's not getting better. What is your suggestion? I said, well, what about hypnotherapy or getting the unconscious mind? I said, well, how's that going to help Jim? Well, I'm not saying hypnotize her, be hypnotize her. When a baby's born, what does it do when it's hungry, baby do? It cries, it wants to eat. So we're not bored, not wanting to eat. So my theory was, young girl, the likelihood is, she's gone into trance because the media, this bullshit media, it says you've got to be a size 8, size 0, you've got to wear this, you've got to walk like that. I'm all for like getting in shape if you want to, it's entirely up to you. But this corporate monster that floods, brainwashes people, that's flipping trance states. So it's about reversing the cycle, going back to a point in her life where she didn't have that association. And that's what I did with her, and have done with people in that situation, to help them improve. They can improve. You aren't born that way. A baby's not born like that. So in a way, trance is all around us. You listen to a song, you're in trance. You watch TV, you're going a state. You, you form a generalization and a belief around a certain area or a certain situation, which is in, a, in effect, really, if you're repeating it habitually without realizing you know what you're doing, it's really a trance state. If you want to argue about the point, that's my philosophy on it. So I'm saying to you, sometimes you've got to go in Deep in the unconscious mind, and it's almost like reverse hypnotherapy, really, getting out of that state. I want to quick disclaimer if you've got any issues medically, or if you've got any issues like depression or anxiety, this is not to treat anybody, it's educational purposes only. So I'm not suggesting what I do is right or wrong, what's going to work for you. It's just an informative seminar, and you take away what you want out of it. I'm not suggesting that you do. If you've got to see a doctor, see a doctor, see a doctor, see a doctor. I'm not making any recommendations only other than educational seminar, okay? Now, as a general rule, cognitive reprogramming is about making it happen. We talked about before. Only you can make it happen and never lose hope. Always believe. So there's a philosophy of cognitive reprogramming. And in cognitive reprogramming, you set goals. Goals are important because a goal without a plan is just a wish. And that's only why we can measure functionality. Okay, so I feel down, says the client. I feel down. What do you feel down about? Well, I feel down because I didn't get this job. I feel down because my partner left. I feel down because my mum didn't or my dad didn't buy me a horse. I feel down because I broke, broke a leg, whatever. So the key thing is, is decide what your goals are to measure functionality. And appreciate sometimes you will feel down. Sometimes you do feel like you've been kicked in the seat. That's just part of life, by the way. And you've got to take responsibility for yourself. Responsibility is key. People blame everybody else other than themselves. And I, people say, Jim, you don't understand. They did this to me. 
Listen, we've all had stuff go on, and life's not fair, by the way. I'm not Pollyanna. I'm not saying the grass is always green. People are wonderful because there's some nasty people out there, and there's a tough world out there. I'm just saying, play it as you see it, and keep going forward, and keep believing in yourself, and take stock and responsibility for your life. Okay? Because all what happens to is your reaction. And I work with people who suffer the most stuff horrendously, and I'll tell you what, people who you would never imagine what they've gone through, have turned it around. They've turned it around. You know, one of the guys who've been on my course did a talk for us. If you, you've probably seen him before. Adrian, if you're watching it, mate, you're an inspiration. Adrian Derbyshire. And he had a situation, he said at the seminar that literally overnight, he was in a hospital. He found himself in a hospital. Doctors everywhere. And they found that he had some tumour and, and, and chemical meningitis or something along them lines. And they told the week to live he had. And after that, week he got through and, and I think months had gone on and he went out for the first time and, and a pair of idiots driving a van through a Big Mac or something at him and shouted at him then he went back inside and withdrew himself and he was looking for help no one there to help he told me he went to the doctor and said what was expected and that's what he gets that's what he gets yeah and what does he do he turns his life around he becomes three time I think gold medal champion at the Olympic Paralympic fencing he goes on to do um, many other great things as well and ironically after his one goal some guys broke into his house and stole his equipment which was expensive didn't compete no more and he goes with this hate crime talks about hate crime helping people what inspiration you're watching Adrian you're a true inspiration you've not seen the DVD watch the DVD on YouTube and be inspired because that man is an inspiration it's not what happens to you it's your reaction okay keep a gratitude though, journal we'll keep that as well we'll talk about that later on in the program the cognitive reprogramming is an idiosyncratic approach, by the way. If the person believes they're green Martian, they are green Martian. It doesn't matter. It's whatever goes through their mind. We meet them in their reality, their map of the world, okay? We don't judge. We uh, have the idiosyncratic approach where it's person centered, very, very person centered, and we focus on solution. We focus on solution. And what are the solutions? What are the solutions to your problem? Many people in society that focus 90% on problem, 10% solution. My philosophy in cognitive reprogramming is 10% problem, 90% solution. Because I don't deny there are problems in the world. I'm sure you are going through problems. We all have problems in life. That's part of life. Life's philosophy, part of growing. It's how we handle it and look for solution, whatever it is. Go forward in life. We don't know what the world means anyway, satirically. Who knows what anything means anyway? So, solutions. And one of the models I use very heavily in cognitive reprogramming is the CBT ABC model. And the CBT ABC model, um, as a consequence, talks about how it's the situation, our interpretation of a situation, whatever event it might be, and how that has a knock on effect in our thoughts, uh, physical feelings and behavior, our, our feelings, behavior, and physical reaction. So what you've got is a situation, and the most important person you'll ever communicate is to yourself, by the way. And what I mean by that, you've got a situation, you can be made redundant, so your thoughts about that situation will impact your feelings, behavior, and physical reaction, okay? So you've got the activating event, you're being made redundant, and then you've got your beliefs about that situation, and then you've got an impact, consequences emotionally, behaviorally, and physically. Okay, because in between here and here, by the way, you've got beliefs and schema, depending on your experiences in life. Let me give you a quick example. So it could be your partner walks out, activating your event, you believe you'll never find anyone like that again, and you feel emotionally sad, down, frustration, your behavior is withdrawn, and physically you feel down, and all the rest of it, and that's a cycle. Or your partner walks out, and you think, what a relief, they're gone, the real sun come back again, and you punch there, woo! Maybe that's a bit far-fetched, and then you behave accordingly, you go out at a good time. Maybe that's too extreme to the other. We might neutralize them. You know what? Well, they don't want to leave me anyway. They're good readers to them. And then, obviously, you know, emotionally, yeah, you might be sad, but you're still productive. Okay, you might go traveling and, and whatever. So that's how we work. And the beauty of the model, the way I use the model, by the way, is we can attack each area. We can go for what we have. We can do interventions on this level, this level, this level, this level, and also here, in between here and here. We can do interventions. You know, some of these things I use, belief change, regression, uh, visualization, anchoring, uh, exercise, breathing, rehearsal, uh, doing emotional exercise, emotional intelligence as well. Just combining whatever it takes to get a positive result. But obviously you've got the goal in mind, which is key. 
to have a goal, to go forward, an outcome you want to achieve for doing what you do. So the beauty of the model is we can do interventions on various levels. So if you're already a therapist anyway, an idea for you might do things like walking, breathing, uh, progressive relaxation, you might do behavioral uh, interventions you've got, you might have visualization, rehearsal, you might do problem solving technique, um, here you might do uh, emotional intelligence work if you want to, or other interventions, and here you might observe your thoughts and do your mindfulness as well, and here you might want to examine belief, do regression, get rid of all belief and, and schema, uh, which is key. And we can work on every level, which is key, and we can become more functional which is really important. Now, schema, I mentioned the word schema, I'm not going to go into too much detail because of time to give you an idea what a schema is. Well, a schema could be classed as a, as a trigger if you want to. Uh, fire hot is the easy one to say. You know, put your hand in fire and put it again because it's hot. To give you an idea, uh, and, and <laughs> to give you an easy explanation of what a schema is, I'll explain it in simplistic terms because of time. Let's say you had this dog and, and your five-year-old had a dog like this, they look like this, and the dog came and attacked you, you know, and beat your face, okay? And you saw a similar dog in park 20 years later, what would you think? Okay, you'd have an association, it could be potentially a trigger to be frightened, or, or, or in emotion, uh, it could be a trigger to be frightened, okay? So it could be a trigger, an early experience in life, or it could not necessarily be an early experience in life, but as a general rule, the earliest experiences are the ones that potentially are going to impact us the most because we have what we call raw filters. We are very impressionable. Our neurons aren't all formed anyway. Or well, imagine this with your best friend and you stroked it all the time and wonderful dog and, and then you saw a single dog 20 years later. You probably see it, give it a big kiss. Why not? Or you never had a dog, we've never seen a dog like this before and you saw one in the park single 20 years ago, there'd be no association. So these things influence our life as we go on. They influence our life all the time. Um, and, and the key thing is, the three main categories that general people use is, is self, others, and the world as a general rule. The example of that, years ago I was working with this woman, she wanted an outcome, being in a relationship was her outcome, to find a relationship. Now, what she had in the relationship she was in, she told me she was married for 10 years and it was a very abusive relationship, she had a negative association uh, in, towards men in a relationship anyway, in that situation, but she wanted a relationship, so she said, I'm not saying being in a relationship is good or bad, by the way. Some people are along in a relationship and what they are in their own. So I'm not judging anybody. I'm just telling the story to show what it's all about. So she saw herself as being unlovable. She saw men as not being able to be trusted. And, and there's some dangerous wall out there because she suffered the bruise, so she said anyway. But she said she was trying from a behavioral process on dating sites, going out, and all the rest of it. Then I said to her, okay, you've not really had any success based on what you're telling me. What else are you doing? She goes, by the way, on Tuesday nights, I have a gathering with all my friends where the men are bastards the evening. A men are, now, whether men are bastards or not is anybody's guess. It's a matter of opinion, one would think. But if you want an outcome, be a relationship, it's probably not a good idea to have that. So I, I did some guided discovery questioning and I said, all men, because I, on the questioning, she talked about having a good relationship with her dad and her brother. I said, what about your dad? He goes, don't you talk about my dad like that? I said, what are you, brother? My brother's a fantastic guy. So I said, all men, there's 3.5 billion men out there, and you mentioned two that are great. So that's the generalization, isn't it? Based on your experience, one experience from what you've told me anyway. And then the three areas generally in life where schemas uh, can be, or the categories where they can cause some sort of debilitation, because you, your beliefs are very rarely examined. We rarely examine our belief. We talked about the treadmill before. We rarely examine our structure of beliefs. And beliefs are a reality. What you believe to be true is true. So if you believe all men are bastards, then you'll behave in a way that works for that belief. If you believe that all men are great, then you'll behave differently. Uh, whether you're right or wrong is entirely up to you. But what I'm saying is that your belief, your structured reality, will impact what you behave and what you do as a consequence. So belief is really important, and we tend to look at beliefs through our own rose tinted glasses. We tend to look at things based on our experience. Okay, so like the dog incident, you might have got bitten by a dog like that, and somebody else had that dog as best friend, but you'll look at it through your own eyes, and the person who's got that dog as best friend is telling you what a great dog they are, and you're kind of, no, I don't believe that. Our structured reality is quite limited to a certain degree. Um, so beliefs about the world, and to show you, and to do a bit of interactivity, he's only keeping interactive. What are some beliefs about the world that you've got? What are some limiting beliefs you've got about the world or the world around you, about yourself and others? 
I mentioned before about that woman and outcome she wanted to go into a relationship. You no know, decent men in the world, about herself, I'm, not, I'm probably not even lovable anyway. And I, um, you know, other people as well, other men are bastards, like she said in the statement. So, whatever it is, what are some beliefs? What outcome do you want and beliefs that don't work for you? Some beliefs. And, and look at how they debilitate you. And as a result of that thought, that will cause emotion. Our thoughts are linked to our emotion. Because if you think of a positive experience, like I mentioned earlier, about when you were happy, that will, if you have a positive experience and good in your life, it will impact emotionally. So your thoughts will have an impact emotionally. Hence, stress, anxiety, depression. If you really want a relationship, and you really want a relationship, you really want a job, you really want a goal, and you think that you're not worth having it, or you can't get it, or it's never going to work for you, every time you bring it into your conscious awareness, and the more you bring it into your conscious awareness, the more you're going to stew out of it, and it's going to have a knock on effect emotionally. You're going to think you're going to be alone for the rest of your life in your relationship, and you're going to sort of clearly think about it, then obviously it's going to cause some level of depression. I talked about earlier expectation in life. We have expectations in life about what we should have, how many kids, what jobs should we have, how much money we should have, how many houses we should own. And the key thing is that sort of all goes into those categories. And if we're underperforming where we think we should be on a certain level, and in life you're always going to have something you'd like more than where you are, that's the nature of a human being. We, we always strive for more. It's just the way we're built psychologically. We're always looking to improve our life in the world that we've created ourselves. And you're always going to feel that shortcoming. So to a degree, you would class that as being some sort of depression, really, because in the end, if you don't feel you are where you want to be, and you're logging on Facebook and seeing everybody else is happy, having a good time, you see the symbol of their life, not the big picture, then what's going to happen is it's going to cause you some sort of depression. And what about some beliefs that empower you? Surely you've got beliefs about yourself, others in the world, so you might believe, you know what, and you might believe that the world, there's great people in the world, um, the world is a great place, and you might believe that being alive is a miracle, uh, you might believe that you're unique and you're a special person. So think about beliefs that empower you. You believe you can drive, no doubt. You believe that you can, you can do a lot of things and, and focus on the things you can do. But beliefs are really important because belief will create your reality. And that's key. So I want you to think about now um, beliefs that you would, a new belief that would empower you. So in the case of that woman, she, we sort of buckled the beliefs she had around men. And she took a new belief, and a new belief that, okay, there are men that have different views of the world than she had. One rules is someone else's rules, the you cast the first stone. It's easy to judge people, isn't it, really, based on own values and beliefs. Yet, in saying that, better to go forward. And she felt that, okay, maybe it didn't work out between her and her husband, and he was what he was, and she was what she was. But there were some good people out there, and that new belief changed her whole existence. And that's the key. Self-communication. So think about beliefs that will change your reality. And we use mindfulness to decide what's helpful. You know, take a time out and close your eyes and notice what's going through your thoughts. You've got to notice what goes through your thoughts and decide what's helpful thinking and what's unhelpful. Is thinking about a bastard a good idea or a bad idea? Well, it could be a good idea if you don't want to be in a relationship, but it's a bad idea if you want to be in a relationship. It's unhelpful, isn't it? So you to decide what is right and wrong for you. Okay, you've got to decide what's helpful. Is it helping? Is it serving me? And one way to decide that, in my experience, is to decide what you want and set outcomes and goals and decide, okay, is that helping me? Or alternatively, am I getting secondary gain from mining about stuff? Some people talk about how hard done they, they are, and, and sometimes people think they're helping somebody else who always moans and listening to them. You're not making it work because some people they get secondary gain, as you know, if you're a therapist. They like the adulation and they'll moan, not thinking for one minute money about an issue, not solving it. And some put it on social media as well, by the way. They put their problem on social media and then I realize 80% don't care and 20% probably glad it's due anyway. So, solution is key. You decide what's helpful and unhelpful. And one of the ways to do that is to examine your thoughts because these thoughts happen automatically. For the most part, these thoughts are okay. What's for tea and I've got to buy the milk and all these thoughts that you have as a general rule of driving to wherever. Many, many thoughts. They say you have uh, roughly 60,000 thoughts a day and the irony is the thoughts you've had today, you'll have tomorrow and you'll have the next day and the ones you've had yesterday because we never examine them. But they are dangerous too. And some of these automatic thoughts, they turn into what we call cognitive distortion. And all the cognitive distortion is, is a thought process that 
Some people call it an irrational belief, potentially, but I think it's rational in your mind if you think it's true. So what I say in cognitive reprogramming is that if it's in the way of an outcome, then it's a problem. And that's your sign. Your sign is the thought problem. Because you might believe men are bastards in your reality, but you don't want to write issues. So what's the big deal? Carry on your life. You might believe that flying is dangerous. If you don't want to fly, it's not really an issue. Okay? You do decide. So whatever it is, so I'm not smart enough, I'm ugly, I'm not likable. It's life. Or it could be causing you emotional uh, negativity. You might feel negative. So examine four and decide which one of these thoughts are. And I've got information, you want more information on cognitive distortions, I can email it to you. If you want to, you can read through uh, variable um, labels we have and, and patterns. You can have a read through if you want to, email me. We'll talk about it later. But what I want to do now is an awareness exercise, because of time, I'm speeding it up, because time is getting the best of me now. I want you to just close your eyes if you don't mind. Close your eyes. And every time I shout, now, I have to write down the thought that comes into your mind. So close your eyes, or if you don't want to close your eyes, keep your eyes open. Now, and write it. Now, and write the thought. Now, and write the thought. Okay, so it's building awareness, and you'll realize for the most part, many of the thoughts that you have are okay. They, they, they come and go but you will have thoughts that can be debilitating in their own way. And they come from a part of the brain, as a general rule, um, we call it the limbic system, and we're not really in control of some of these thoughts to a certain extent, which is why we dig deep and we use um, hypnotherapy and, 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 and train state to, 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 to start restructuring the thought process because this is a part of the brain that's pretty primal. And one of the key parts of this brain is this part of the brain here, hippocampus thoughts, emotional memory. And time isn't chronological in our mind. You see people talk about fighting the war 60 years ago, they start to cry when it goes to their conscious awareness. So time is not really a healer. And if you have trauma in your own life, deal with it as early as you possibly can. So the more powerful the memory, the higher it is accessible, one would think, in the part of the brain that feeds into the conscious part of the brain. And bearing in mind too, we've got part of the brain called the amygdala as well, and that's our fight, flight, freeze. We're not in control of the fight, flight, freeze response to a point, because from a primal point of view, we used to have, and we'll talk about it shortly, dinosaurs that roam the world. We don't have that no more, but we'll talk about the world we live in now. But think about one moment you smell food, you're walking on a Saturday night, you smell a nice curry or a pizza, and you start salivating and all the like. Okay, you're not in control of that. Okay, or you see fire and you put your hand in fire before, you're not put your hand in fire again. So your emotional memory, you know, it causes you pain or whatever, have that situation. And that's that primal instinct. You say, okay, why don't you just take the middle way out? You took the middle way out, the problem you've got, you probably run across the motorway. So we don't really want to take the middle way out because it serves to a point. What we want to do is start retraining the mind because the middle responds the same way. To, to, to dinosaurs roaming the earth, there's no more dinosaurs roaming the earth anyway, to work stress to a certain degree. We still go to fight, flight, free spawn, response, all the stresses of one day living within the chronically agitated world. That's fight, flight, freeze. We've got bills, we've got many, many pressures all over the place. And when you think about it, eventually it's going to debilitate us and cause us stress. And obviously, stress leads onto one thing and the other. And you don't need me to tell you about the effects of long-term stress. Just like a fizzy pop, you keep shaking it, boom! Or just like a piece of paper, you rip one piece, you're okay, you keep ripping it, you end up with a mess. And think about the world in the eyes of a baby. You've got neutrality, you're a baby, you must be amazing. You're born, you see lights, you see faces, you don't know anything about anything, and you go through life. And you learn, and you learn behaviors. And for a baby, it's pretty simple, easy. You, you, you want to cuddle, you want love. You cry, someone holds you, you want to be changed, you cry, you want to be fed, watered, you cry. It's pretty, pretty straightforward, isn't it? But as you go in life, we start learning. And from about zero to seven years of age, what happens then is, is the imprint phase, we're very impressionable. If someone says to you, okay, um, between this period, you're ugly, you're not going to be able to challenge it the same way you could do when you get older. Because your filters are raw. Your neurons aren't formed yet. If I said to you, you can't drive, you've been driving for 20 years, would it stop you driving? Probably not. If you say to someone at that age, 
they can't do something, then it could be a generalization. So that's why they're saying in conventional psychology, the child's father and the man, who believe it's true, but you can still change. Then 8 to 13, as a general rule, we, we model people. If you've got kids, you probably say the same thing to your kids, your parents say to you, and you choose who you model. You can model um, a bad person who does really, really bad things. You can model someone who's really, really an athlete, or, or you can model someone who's a great person or a great one in society. So we, we, we model people a lot at that age. 13, 19 is the social phase. All we do at that age, we tend to hang out with our friends, and if your friends are you know, nasty, do nasty things and bad things, then you'll probably do what they do. Um, if you've got friends that are into sport or music, you're probably then to do what they do. So it's a social phase. Then beyond that, 1900s, you've got that business persona, your work becomes your identity. Okay, who's ever been for a meal on a night out and you said, I'm not going to talk about work and you talk about work? Or how you introduce yourself. Like I said earlier, I said what I said earlier is going to make sense. You introduce yourself to saying, you know what, I'm this, I'm that. And that becomes your identity. And the danger is of your identity becoming a profession is very, very dangerous because if you think about it, for example, if you're a professional footballer, and you get paid 200 grand a week for kicking the ball, a bag of air. And I'm into sport myself, by the way, I'm just using it as an analogy. Um, and all of a sudden, you're used to the crowd, validation. And then one day, you won't be that pro footballer anymore, you'll just be like anybody else. You could be the president of America, one day you're just going to be an old man or whatever, but you could be a top doctor, lawyer, and one day you're going to lose identity. And what happens then? You're stripped of who you are. Who am I then? And you've built your self-worth on your professionalism. So that's a dangerous thing to do as well. And that's caused a lot of issues in society. And cognitive reprogramming is about building an identity as young as you possibly can. And I'm going to talk about ways you can do that. And if identity is not what you want it to be, start defining yourself uh, as you do. Because identity, I'm going to talk about in more detail as we go along, is very powerful. But the beauty is neuroplasticity. The brain can rewire itself. It's been proven the brain can rewire itself and through experience, and, and it's about flooding the brain with new experiences. So we like to use an analogy to build almost like a, a different maps in the brain and, and to light parts of the brain up with new experiences to rewire it. So bad experiences override negative experiences with good experiences over and over again. Flood it with emotions, positive emotions, as and when you can. But we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. From a cognitive reprogramming point of view, it's like being a detective and sort of working out which sports, uh, what outcome is, which sports are getting in the way of outcomes, how they're impacting mood and mindset. So you're playing detective. Now, we mentioned about a big part of cognitive reprogramming is, is defining who you are. So who are you? And I was doing a talk a while ago at a school that I grew up in. I talked about the stuff I've gone to achieve in sport and everything else. And I bumped into an old friend from school and she obviously since then been many many years and in her own mind she's still at the same identity she still believed in her own mind she was like the prom queen it's like hello get over it you're not prom queen no more and she was on a destructive uh, behavioral because she was doing loads of not i'm against cosmetic surgery and that sort of stuff it's fine it's entirely up to you but she was trying to validate herself and, and capture her youth again that's a horrible place to be isn't it when you're trying to recapture and get validity self-validation is key we all like to be able to validate on some level you been saying that getting internal validation is key. And being very strong in your character is key. And sometimes your identity can have a massive impact. How you define who you are will impact your behavior in a big way and emotionally will impact how you feel about yourself. And I've talked in dinner tables, we've had professional people all introduce themselves, being one thing or the other, and you get the person in the room. I'm just the mum, by the way. Well, just the mum is probably the most powerful role of any of us because just the mum, you've got to be psychiatrist, psychologist, cook, um, pastoral role, it's a phenomenal job. So you're not just the mum, you're an amazing person, but we sort of get so hung up as we get older from 1935 and beyond with this identity. And that's why people retire and they struggle for their retirement, when they retire from sport and they struggle because they become validation for identity. Uh, many years ago with this model, and she went into modeling because she was bullied when she was young and she wanted to prove a point that she was attracted in the eyes of corporation and she strived and strived and strived when she went to retire from that industry to go into the industry she was doing bad things to herself, drinking and everything else and they weren't getting anywhere with her and we did some work on this level because identity 
she built her worth on pictures getting a job. And that's more, there's more to someone to, to doing that. And we had to build validation in other areas and get internal validation and be happy with who you are because you're enough. Whoever you are, whatever you do, you have value, which is key. Nothing wrong with striving and, and going out and having goals, but when it becomes your worth, it's a dangerous place to be. And I ask you the question, I do this with my clients, what value do you add to others just being you? You just being you, what value do you add to other people? Forget your work, forget anything else other than you. What value do you add to other people? What value do you add? What value? And I, it's a broad question. So you just being you, loving person, warm person, humor, or you just sitting there and being there and being the amazing person that you are adds value to people just being you. And it's about reclaiming identity again. And that's the question you ask your, your, your clients to start building things back up again. You've got your children, it's early on in life, ask them what value do you pride others as being you? Because kids, very young, it's great for them to aspire, but also they've got to be aware that they're enough as they are. You are enough. And one of my motivations to going in and helping people in schools, and young people, was that as a young person I suffered a lot. We had a very challenging upbringing, and I wanted to sort of go out there and help people who went through what I went through. And I never felt enough, no matter what I did, until eventually I worked out one day, I'm enough as I am, and I gave me peace of mind. Okay? A Ford diary in cognitive reprogramming, we use a Ford diary to monitor our thoughts. We, just like you would monitor food that you eat, if you're on a diet, you, or you're on an eating plan, you have a thought diary to work out how your thoughts are impacting your emotions, behavior, and physical. So you carry a diary around with you, a thought stopping technique, and whenever you've got thoughts that debilitate you, you can do thought stopping. I've got a DVD on thought stopping on its own. I don't have a lot of time to go through the whole technique with you. But it's basically, in, in cognitive reprogramming, a little bit different to the approach I use in CBT, I use an incantation. Okay, so you can shout, enough or stop or you can pick a wristband like an anchor in NLP and break that negative state so next time you think of a negative state think about a negative thought that you have and notice you start feeling emotionally so you can do this process now think of a negative situation in your life as you think of a negative situation in your life notice you start feeling emotionally when you start feeling negative emotionally shout stop I'm enough and put emotion into it because just doing the CBT approach, shouting stop or, or thought stop, is good, but does it nullify the, once the emotion starts picking up and gathering ground, like a snowball, is it enough? So you've got to challenge another emotion and shout. I'm not saying shout in the shopping mall, but you know, just stop your thoughts. So remember that, whenever you feel negative thoughts spiraling and impacting you emotionally, behaviorally, and physically, um, incantation or just jump in the air and use everything. Mind, because you can use correct one area or correct the others as well. So you can use your body, okay? So think of a negative thought again and now stand up and just punch the air and say, Enough! I'm great! I'm fantastic! And put emotion into it and think about all the great experiences you've ever had. So the DVD on that, you can watch that if you want to, okay? Imagery is really good as well. You close your eyes, go back to a time when you felt really relaxed and you can't think of the time. Imagine what it would be like to be really relaxed. Find your peace. Every day I have five minutes where I find my peace. I go to a place in my mind where I feel relaxed and notice what you see, hear and feel. So you can transport yourself back to a time you felt calm and relaxed. Or you can imagine what it's like to be in a place that's calm and relaxed, whatever works for you. And use your senses. What do you see, what do you hear, what do you feel? You can do it now for half a minute. So close your eyes and go back to a time when you felt really relaxed and at peace with the world that's what you heard, what you saw, what you felt and let those things magnify your body you can't think of a time imagine you think all your thoughts in the bin liner pick them up in a minute if you wish but imagine what it would be like what would you see if you were relaxed, what would you hear, what would you feel and you can practice that imagery other stress busters you can do as well is go for a walk, take a siesta Take a bath, listen to music, talk to a friend, exercise, meditate. All of the above, you can do that as well. Have a balanced life. If you have a balanced life, you focus too much on one area, then the other area is going to suffer. You can focus too much on career, 
uh, or too much on your friends or in your health. Getting a balance is key. It's not always easy to get the balance. And at different times in your life, you're going to focus more on one area than the other. But if you focus too much on one area, think I'm going to focus on career, then what will probably happen, thinking one day if I get my career to where I want it to be, then I can provide my family, then you might lose out on being around your family. Your kids grow up, you're not there to support your wife, or wife not there to support husband, whatever it might be, and you're just apart. So the key is, yeah, sometimes we've got to put the hard yards in, but do bear in mind, maybe have a, a day where it's just family time, switch the phone off, nobody home, anyone phones you, I'm not home, call me back in a year. Have a day where you leave the farm, have a day or days where you focus on health, or spend some time with friends, and be there with your friends, not go for a restaurant and, and be on the farm like that. You know, talk, communicate, be in the table with your family if you can. Okay, and then when you've got to work, work. And sometimes you're going to have more time in one area than the other. We've all been there, but getting the balance is key. Uh, activity schedule, plan things that you enjoy doing in your day. It's really important. Do things that you enjoy doing as well. Plan at least one thing a day you enjoy doing. Could be listening to music for half an hour, could be going for a walk, seeing a friend, a warm bath, whatever. Um, but new stuff that you enjoy doing as well. Put it in your daily plan because then you've got that to look forward to, okay? And whatever it is, make it a positive thing. So, okay, it's not a good idea to put, I'm um, gonna eat uh, two tubs of ice cream at 10 o'clock at night if you're looking to lose a little bit of weight. It might be that, you know what, you do, it might be you do treat yourself on the weekend, have the 80-20 rule. But the key thing is do stuff that you enjoy doing as well. Because life is short, it's meant to be fun as well. Relaxation is key, have a time out, at least every day for 10 minutes. Have, have just a, a breakaway, a time out. Now be relaxed and, and you close your eyes and just breathe and be aware of your breathing and your heartbeat and just any thoughts coming to your head, just let them drift out. Your mind is bottled with thoughts, it's okay. You have to fight them. Sometimes it's easy to relax, sometimes it's more difficult. If you want to distract your mind, then you might do progressive muscle relaxation. You can tense your toes or you squeeze your fist and release. You can tense your toes, release, tense every muscle group from your body. And as you tense, breathe and breathe out. You could do breathing exercise. Breathe in one, two, three. Breathe out one, two, three. It's entirely up to you what you do and how you do it. Now, your call, but you can, you can regulate uh, from my point of view. We, we talked about that. Uh, do what makes you happy, uh, really important. And you can write down now, write a thing. Do less of the stuff that you don't enjoy doing and do more of what you enjoy doing. Write down one thing. Write one thing that you're going to do less of. So it could be I'm going to moan less. It could be I'm going to praise someone more. It could be I'm going to stop associating with this person if they're not good for you. I'm going to associate with these people. It could be I'm going to stop going to the uh, pub every night or watching a soap every night. I'm going to sign up for a course. I might go to salsa dancing. Do things that make you happy, which is key. And we do free changes, what we do in kind of reprogram, we make it real. It's not about going to a seminar and punching the air saying, yeah, I'm fantastic, I'm superb, woo and then you go on Monday morning, and then you flat again, and then the bills come in, and it's about progressive and accepting that, yeah, these seminars are great, you feel like a million dollars at the end of it, but you've got to have a plan, you've got to keep working at it. So think about free changes that you can do as a result of maybe if you want to, you don't have to, you're not entitled to, you know, to account anything you don't want to do, but three changes that you might want to do, think about doing. As a result of this, it might be, I'm going to meditate, walk, I'm going to do visualization. When will I do it? Tomorrow I'll go for a walk, the following day I'll meditate, the day after that I'll go for a bike ride, or I'll listen to music, or whatever really, but think about it, and, and make it real, okay? And then one way to sort of measure a client's progress with your therapist is what they're doing on a daily basis. That's the only way we can quantify if someone's improving their functionality. Because if you come to you and say, I feel depressed, I want to feel happy, then that's insinuating they're depressed all the time. I'm sure that nobody's depressed all the time, if you see them every day, there'll be times they might be okay, windows of opportunity. We want to expand that window, even if it's just a minute, to two minutes, five, an hour, more and more. That's the key to functionality. We can only measure it through what we do, which is key. Meditation is really important, we talked about that before. There's been scans, you can look at the internet that show brainwave activity during and after meditation. It's very powerful stuff. I don't have a lot of time to go into it. I'm not just saying spiritual meditation, I'm just saying a timeout. Whatever and whichever way you want to put it is key. But it's been proven to work and it's getting into schools now and it's fantastic to get into schools because it's key. 
Um, what you eat as well is key. Um, food can be either poison or medicine, so they say food is key. And it's not easy to get great food because the supermarkets aren't stocked with a lot of good food and the options aren't always easy. You've got to go out there and, and source decent food out. If you do nothing else, cut back on processed foods as much as you possibly can do because processed foods have low nutritional values and they, they have provide very um, poor energy source as well. And you cut back, and we'll talk about it very briefly, but in the seminar, high foods that are high in the glycemic index, they need that sugar rush. You want more stable, lower GI, uh, foods with high nutritional value, which is key. So as a general rule, some key tips where food's concerned, uh, less carbonated drinks, refined sugar, artificial sweeteners and colors, processed foods, minimize them. Okay, eat less crap if possible because it affects your mind and mood. Eat more fruits and vegetables. And before anyone says to me, Jim, well, fruit has sugar. Yes, it does. I'm not saying eat 20 watermelons a day, but the nutritional value of, say, watermelon or grapes nullifies some of the effects that have from a sugar point of view. So if you eat in moderation, it can be a good thing. And if you just eat vegetables alone, vegetables don't always taste great. And they're also good to get a balance of things as well. So fruits are refined sugar, yeah, sugar, sugar, no matter what it is, uh, yeah, in saying that, it has the same effects on body, what I'm saying is remember that fruits have nutritional values, which are good for you as well. But you are right, some fruits are very high in, in, in glycemic index and can cause mood destabilization uh, and give you the same effect as some refined sugar can to a point, remember that they've got also nutrition too. Um, organic lean proteins, uh, omega free if you can, and drink loads of water. Uh, which is key. I've got myself some uh, coconut water here. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, I'm not on commission. Uh, one of the key things I say, vegetables, greens, go green. High alkaline levels, I do juicing. I throw broccoli, cucumber, all sorts in the morning. Uh, have a lemon juice, uh, what some things I do to high alkaline. I focus on lower GI foods. I eat as much vegetables as I can. Uh, high nutritional values, cut processed foods. Yeah, I love going for a meal on the weekend uh, or whatever. Yeah, and I'm not going to get too hung up on like some people do. They get so hung up on eating that they forget you've only got one life. But as a general rule, you feel better eating high alkaline foods. You know, think about batteries, they're high in alkaline, it's got energy. Uh, lemon water first thing in the morning is quite good with warm, warm water. And 80 20 will get a bit of a balance because some people get so hung up on and what they eat, it can't be a good thing psychologically. We haven't got much time to go through a lot in detail. We've got other videos that go into more detail for that. If you want to read more research or email me, I'll send you more stuff. Exercise I mentioned earlier, it doesn't have to be um, just exercise as in gym, it can be just you know combined social. Play some tennis, um, squash, beautiful light evenings now, a bit of tennis with the family, um, go out and play with the cricket, football, whatever really, you get a social element too as well as the endorphins and other chemicals that are produced in the brain for exercise. Keep a gratitude list every day, write all the things you're grateful for. Gratitude is very powerful. I've done a good meditation you can have and download. It's on our Facebook page and we've emailed that to everybody. And you can have that. When you focus on gratitude, it's not easy to be down or depressed when you focus on gratitude because gratitude, you experience different emotion. You experience a positive emotion that goes with that. Every morning, I'll write a gratitude list. So write all the things you're grateful for. And you'll find the things that you're grateful for are priceless. Um, eliminate triggers where possible. Not every trigger is possible to eliminate. So it could be on social media, an impact on your psychology. I just mentioned get the meditation on social media. But what I mean by that is, you know, minimize your uh, things that have an impact on you. It could be a positive thing for you. But minimize triggers when you can. It's idealistic because we've got to work, we've got things to do in life, and of course the world around you. But things like, you know, not watching the news at night or in the morning, uh, things like not reading paper, stuff like that can be triggers as well emotionally. You pick up the Daily Mail, there's always a horror story and you watch the news and it's the world going to end. If you go two or three days without TV and reading paper, you feel so much better to refresh and recharge. So when you can, get rid of triggers. Uh, another process I use is called RRR, record your thoughts when we close our eyes and, and mindfulness, use mindfulness technique, rationalize our thought and we replace it which is another technique for another day. But for example, it might be okay to record the thought, men a bastard, rationalize it by asking questions. All men, out of 3.5 billion men, using counter examples, is it true? Is it really valid? Replace that thought with, okay, some men might have a different way of living to me, but that's their rules. 
Uh, there was theirs, mine and mine. Uh, I believe there are good people out there, because I know some good people out there, and replace and start restructuring our thought process, uh, which is key. So using that approach in any way you can. And you can have uh, some resources on that if you want to. There's a time. Visualization as well, not just about going to a place where you can relax, but seeing yourself do stuff. Just like a baby, we learn to walk and talk through watching and modeling. What you can do is rehearse in your own mind. Anything from, you know, if you've got anxiety, going to a shop, right through to going for an interview, presentation. So what you can do is you visualize yourself uh, and you, you prepare a script of what you want to do as an outcome. So it could be anything from, say, you know, playing golf or, or striking a ball in football, right through from going to an interview, you prepare a script of how you want it to go. Remember to keep it in a positive, and what I mean by positive, the mind can't process any instruction. So what you want to happen, if I say that thing of blue giraffe, you think what I said not to say, a bit like the gym instructor says, don't bend your back, don't bend your knees on the rowing machine, keep your back straight, knees in that position. So write a script and see yourself doing that script. It could be a behavior that you do. You might get angry really quickly. You might react in certain ways. And just see yourself doing something different Then watch yourself like watching a screen, your eyes closed, step in the screen, doing it here and now, and imagine doing it a few times, rehearsing it, and then what will happen then? It becomes a pathway in your brain. And it's been proven, they've proven that the mind can't tell its reality and non-reality uh, to a point, and they've done studies of sports people practicing through visualization, improving more than people who practice physically. So it's a powerful exercise, I've got a DVD on that as well if you want it, you can have it and re, uh, watch it, and I've got some literature you can, you can read if you want to. Ultimately the secret is, in using philosophy again, which is really powerful stuff, is to focus on the new and not, up, not get too hung up about who you were. Uh, what I mentioned that girl I mentioned earlier, who the model of the issue, she kept going another past, I said, oh, that he was into her past. I said, that's not really relevant now, what's relevant is now, and going forward, which is key. So no matter what you be through, where you are, where you're going, Start with where you are and go forward to where you want to be and focus on building new rather than get too hung up on, on the old. Um, key points, think positively, exercise daily, eat healthy, work hard, stay strong, worry less, dance more, have fun, love often, be happy and go out there. There's one life, better to love and lose, not to love at all. Sometimes we hard on the line, it doesn't work out the way you want it to. Just live life, go for it. You know, there's nothing to lose. It's not a rehearsal. Some people will ridicule it. Some people will be there for you. Some people you do stuff for people who, for them, and they ridicule it, which is ironic, really. But what the heck? So be it. Live anyway. That's the key. Because it's the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world. They quite often do. And watching this DVD or watching this live event proves that you do want to learn. We're always learning, and it's implementing and going out there and having it, which is key. By all means, I've condensed so many hours in an hour, roughly an hour, so I'd love to cover short space of time. Many things I'd like to go into more detail. Uh, many things I would have liked to have done more of. But please email me. You can watch this DVD again if you want to. We'll make it available through email and social media. But do contact me on, on Twitter, Facebook. I've been slagging social media up all evening. Uh, and the outside contact me through. But it's all about moderation and using it for the right reasons. And, and do get in touch if you need any resources. I'm more than happy. My mission, my goal is, my goal is, is to help as many people as possibly can. I want to get this stuff in schools. I really want to make a big impact. Um, a big impact out there. Um, I told you earlier before, as a young person, I really suffered for one reason or the other, and it wasn't great, and I always had in my mind to help people. And what got me out of that situation I was in was my talent in sport, and I got out of that environment and would on, go on to do well. But what really helped me go do well in sport was things like NLP and psychology and, 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 and stuff like that. that I had coaches I had that had skills in that area that helped me a lot. And I had so many debilitations like asthma and challenges and beliefs, and it helped me to have a great life. And I'm very appreciative of the life I've had. I've had many ups and downs. Those of you who know me, you'll know that. I can go pound for pound with anyone. Yet in saying that, I felt in my own mind, one day I want to you know, put something forward. So if you've got your own kids, or you're a teacher, or you want to work uh, with young people, I say, you know what, um, get it out there and help them because it's a knock-on effect, and we are on that. Uh, we don't want to see the world spiraling into this. Uh, massive mental health issue. Someone's got to do something, and you might think only one person. You know, one person is more than no one, and one person like a ripple in the sea of a punk have a massive impact. And you know what? For yourself as well, which is key. 
you know, feel good about yourself, not saying dedicate your life to it, but you know, spend, whether you're a coach, therapist, it's a teacher, or anybody really, um, people go through stuff, you know, all through my life, and having done a lot of stuff that I've done, there's been times that have been very, very challenging, but I've been very fortunate enough to go on to write books, do radio, develop, you know, this process and many other things and meet many people around the world. I've had ups and downs, you know, and you don't know what people are going through and I don't know what you're going through and sometimes you make judgment about people. It costs nothing to be sensitive around people and I'm not saying for the I love a good laugh as well and humor's great, but sometimes be mindful because we're all in it together. We're all connected in some way, shape or form and I think that we've got to realise that an obligation to keep taking the world forward and keep the, being there for each other as, as human beings and, and make the most of this beautiful gift we have called life. So have a fantastic evening, enjoy the rest of the beautiful evening that we have and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you.